Uh, welcome to my presentation. This is um, Meet Cute Quick. Um, I'm Roberto Raggi. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Nokia. I work in Berlin. Uh, I, I'm part of the Qt Creator team where I mostly do the C++ and the QML editor. Uh, but I also contributed to the design and uh, the implementation of uh, QML. So Qt Quick. Uh, this talk is about Qt Quick. Um, so what is Qt Quick? It is a set of technologies that we introduced to help developers and designers to create modern um, looking user interfaces. Uh, it comes with a new language, we call it QML, a set of user interface elements. It's a very rich set of user interface elements. We have a lot of stuff there. Um, rectangle, list view, flickable elements, a lot of stuff. And, and we also created a number of tools on top of our Qt Creator IDE. Um, QML. Uh, so QML is new language, it's a, a declarative programming language. So it is probably a little bit different than Java, C Sharp, or C++. But you don't have to be scared. Uh, I will try to uh, explain uh, what is this declarative stuff uh, later in a minute. But don't be scared because it's very easy to learn. Uh, it has a very simple, clear, and elegant syntax. And um, you can use JavaScript to um, define behaviors. So if you are a JavaScript developer, you are in pretty good shape. Um, also, QML builds on the Qt meta object. So you get all the stuff that you have with Qt object. So you have properties, signals, slots, invocable methods. All the stuff that you can do with Qt objects, they are exposed in QML elements. We have a versioned module system. Uh, we have built-in support for animations. And QML also integrates NICE with existing technologies like uh, Qt C++, Qt 3D, Qt Mobility, WebKit, and so on. The built-in support for animation is quite interesting. Uh, you can create states, uh, you can manipulate states, and you can also define transition between those states. Of course, you can do way more than this. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I want to introduce a subset of the um, QML language and the subset of the Qt Quick uh, module. So, um, okay, in order to use the Qt Quick elements, you need to import the module. And you do that um, with the import statement. Uh, that is, you just write import Qt 4.7. Uh, and, and you're good. At this point, you can use all the Qt Quick elements. If you're using Qt 4.7.1, you may want to use import Qt Quick 1.0. Um, this is, these are aliases, so if you use Qt 4.7, you would be good, but we really feel like that this is something new and should have its own module and its own uh, version. So you do this, and then you will get a lot of elements, visual elements and non-visual elements. So for example, you would get rectangle, uh, image, border image, list view, grid view, you know, uh, a lot of components. But you also get just simple objects, like Qt object, which is uh, the QML name of Q object. Uh, you also get timer, list model, XML list model, and, and so on. So how does it look like? What is the syntax? Um, well, at the end of the story, a QML file is a bunch of object instantiations and property bindings. And how do you instantiate those elements, the one that you imported, for example? Uh, it's very simple. You just uh, write the name and then uh, follow it by curly braces. So for example, if you want to instantiate a rectangle, you just write rectangle, open brace, close brace. Now question is, how do you create a new component? You know, the Qt Quick library has a bunch of components, but you want to create your own component, like a button. Well, this is also very easy. If you want to create a button, you, you create a file called button.qml, you put your code inside, and then you instantiate it like any other QML component. You just write button, open brace, close brace. Those are real QML files, you could, execute, um, you could execute them. In general, you will have quite a number of objects and you can nest them, uh, they will probably form a tree. Uh, for example, here we have a mouse area uh, enclosed in a text element and then this text element is enclosed in a rectangle and you can go and you, know, and, and you can imagine, you can do whatever you want there, you can have um, pretty deep hierarchies. 
Um, and another nice feature is that you can name objects. And you tag that uh, using this, ID, this special ID property. So in this example, uh, I'm saying that this particular instance of this particular rectangle, it is called a root. And then you can use root to reference this rectangle. So initializer. So what, what's the stuff that you can put inside the braces? I mean, we, we, call, we call that code object initializer. We saw it before that you can instantiate new QML element inside. But you can do may, way more than that. For example, you can um, set properties. So in this snippet, you, you see like, uh, you know, like a QML file looks like. It's a bunch of property instantiation, um, uh, sorry, object instantiation and property bindings. Um, now, what are those property bindings? I, I'm, I'm going to run quick over this stuff because uh, I want to show these things in Crit Creator. But we saw a few examples in the previous slides. Uh, and the general syntax is, uh, you know, you just write the property name followed by a colon sign followed by some JavaScript code. And here, this is exactly the beauty of the language. You can use all the power of JavaScript on the right-hand side of properties. We have a couple of examples here. For example, uh, I know the first row shows that you can use plain literals, like uh, you can say that width is 100 and text is the string QML. You, you can use a more complex JavaScript expression, like uh, you know the width is the width of the other uh, of that button. Uh, conditionals, but you know any JavaScript uh, expression, and you can also uh, create side effects. For example, you can open a block and call functions like like we are doing, and eventually you can return a value. In this case, the string hello QML. So it's very powerful. Um, that's pretty much it, but. We have to tell something about those properties, those property bindings. They are not normal properties. Uh, they are a little bit special. Uh, and they are special because they are observed. I mean, the QML engine is watching them and it will notify the object uh, every time that particular property changes. Um, and you can hook there. Eventually you can do whatever you want um, in, in those hooks. In this particular example, we are watching the property with and you get a notification every time that width changed. And well, you can guess the pattern. You essentially, uh, you just have to create a new binding uh, where your property in this case is width and you have the prefix on and the suffix changed. This stuff is automatically generated so, so you will get it for any property that you have. And then you can execute any arbitrary code. In this particular case, I'm just printing a message. Of course, you can, um, add your own properties. I mean, elements, they will have their own in general, but that doesn't mean that you can't extend those. And uh, you do that uh, with the property keyword. It's very simple. In this particular example, we are introducing the property name uh, of type string with uh, initialize it with that string QML, and then we use it. And then as you can see at the end, we also get notification for this property. So every time, I assign a new value of this property, um, I will get a notification. This is very important. You can do the same with signal. Um, the only difference is that you will introduce a new signal with the signal keyword, followed by the signal name and an optional signature. Um, and you can invoke signal uh, like, uh, you know, like it's like the syntax is exactly the same of calling a function. You just uh, name the signal, and, and then you, you, you eventually you pass the arguments. And then you can connect to them. Uh, then again, for each signal, you will have this automatically generated slot, uh, which has this pattern, on as a prefix, and then the signal name. That's pretty much it. That's all we need from the QML language. Uh, so as you can see, if you know JavaScript, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, you, you just have to know how to instantiate objects, but that is as easy as know the object name. And then you need to know the properties you want to use, but that is something that you can find in our documentation. Now, I want to introduce a few elements that I'm going to show you in, uh, in uh, my demo. Uh, you, I mean, you get those by importing the Qt Quick library. Um, they are very simple, uh, it's not, not too complicated. So the first one is the rectangle, which as you can guess, is just a rectangle with an optional border. Then it, there is a text, which will help you 
to have text in the scene. Then you have a border image, which is an image that you can resize, but keep the border. And the mouse area, which is this magic component that we have, which enables mouse handling. Um, those visual properties, they have uh, common properties. For example, uh, the X and Y, as you expect, the width and height, but they also have uh, anchoring. Anchoring is something that we introduced with QML, and it's uh, a way, a very declarative way, to position an item, um, specifying essentially its relationship with other items. And that is very declarative. So that's, um, I'm not going too deep into this example, because I think that it is better to show this in Qt Creator. Uh, but this is the whole idea. Since all the properties are watched, um, the idea is that you will express uh, the logic of your element in context. In context, That means uh, you will express, for example, how do you move related to another element. Another element. So that's it. So I think we can, um, uh, we can start and play with Kit Creator, which I have it here. Yeah. Okay, so this is Qt Creator 2.1, and we added uh, support for Qt Quick. So you will find um, um, a, a number of Qt Quick projects. We will go for uh, the Qt Quick UI project, which is very simple project. So we call this one QML. Oops, I already have a directory called QML. So QML2. Um, this is a QML file. Um, I can increase a little bit font. And now you can read it. Um, the import Qt 4.7 statement tells you that we are using the, the Qt quick elements. We have a top level rectangle, and we have some width and height, and inside an, another text element. I, I can run this. Um, I don't think that this text element is, is that interesting. Um, so what, what can I do here now? Um, for example, I can name this particular item. Uh, uh, I don't know, I, I'll call this this app. And I can change the size, let's say 600 by 600. And now I'm running it, and well, the window got bigger. Okay, so how do I create, uh, how do I create a new component? Um, well, as I said before, you just create a new QML file. We call it button.qml, it's there. Actually, we don't need this width and height. Um, I can assign some color. Let's say that this is a blue rectangle for now. And now I can instantiate it here um, with some different width and height. Let's say, I don't know, 100, um, 30, sorry. I mean, that's it. Uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, of course, this doesn't really look like a button, but we can do something about this. So, uh, so instead of Making a set of using a rectangle, we just use an item. And as you can see, Creator tells you that this property is now an invalid property because uh, you know color doesn't exist for items. You can get a hint about the properties that you can set uh, by using the completion engine. So you just type control space and you get all the properties of this element, and also the generated slots and signal. Um, okay, so we have an item. I call this one um, this button, and I'm going to use this uh, magic border image element. Um, it's nothing special, really. It's just um, um, an, an image which can be stretched. I have a, a nice image here, I think. Um, and now I can run it. Well, that that kind of looks like a button now. Um, and, and and I can uh, I can resize it. So for example, let's say that this one would be 200. You know, it will. Oops. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> oh, of course. I'm sorry. Um, and that's because I didn't I didn't use the anchoring. So what I actually have to do, I have to set the size for for this image. So it was always taking the size of of the original image. Well, what we want to do is to fill all the available area. So uh, you have this automatic this property called parent, which is your enclosing object. And what we are saying is to stretch to to this image. So now this image grows. Uh, so let's make it. It grows. 
it still doesn't look like a button because I can't press it, I don't have text, um, and you know, that, that's our goal. But that's, that's something that we can solve, so what we do is to create two images, and then we create what is called this mouse area, which enable mouse events. Um, this mouse area, I, I'm going to give a name to this mouse area so then I can use it, and I call this one button area. Um, this mouse area has one property, which is called pressed, which uh, essentially you, you, you can listen to this property, and it tells you if you are pressing the button, the mouse button, on this mouse area. So we need to place this mouse area, and we do exactly the same things we did before. We use anchors, and we say, okay, you know, you should take all the available space of your parent. So that means that you know you will get notified. Uh, it doesn't matter where you click in, in your parent. And now what I can do is, uh, well, I can make, for example, this item visible if uh, the button area is not pressed. And I can make this other item visible if the button, oops, sorry, the button area is pressed. Now I'm here, um, and this is a button now. You know, I can click it. Um, we still need some text. Um, then again, I'm using the same trick. So I create a text element. Um, I, can, I can assign some text. OK, for example. And now I need to anchor it. As I said before, the anchors object is very powerful. I mean, you, you can guess from, look at how many properties you have there. Um, one, one other nice way is to anchor is uh, using the centering. So I can say, I want to anchor this text at the center of its parent. Um, and now it doesn't matter of the size of the parent, you will be always be at the center. So this is an okay button. Um, still, I would like to change the text. Uh, okay, it's okay, but you know it's a little bit dark coded. So, so what we can do is um, to introduce a new property. We know the syntax. It is a string, and it is called text. And then I can say, okay, you know what? The text of this element should be um, the text of this button. Now I can, this is a property that I introduced, and now this property is also available in the code completion engine. So I have it, and I can change the text, like uh, cool stuff. There we go. So this is a button. This actually wasn't much work. Uh, and, and if you have a nice um, images, you can, uh, you, you know, you, you can do a lot. You can do quite a bit with those border image. Um, so what about other things like, you know, the signals, like clicked, for example? Um, well, we know that we can introduce a new signal by using the signal keyword. And now we need to emit the signal. And here we will use that other feature we saw before, the auto-generated slot. So that means that when you clicked on this mouse area, what we want to do is to emit that signal. I mean, that's, that's all you need. Um, now here, I get in the completion the automatically generated slot for that signal. And here I can do, I don't know, Oops. Oops. Um. It's it's very powerful. So you can create your elements, uh, you know, in uh, with very few lines of code. It's not only about creating elements and widgets. You can do animations. You can do magic things. So yet, for example, let's, this mouse area, it's, it's quite magic. Um, and if you look at what we did, it, it's actually not much code. It's uh, well, about 30 lines of code, and we did nothing more than placing a couple of images, uh, a text element, and the mouse area. Um, let's take a look at a completely different example. Let's take a look at you know, a slider. You know, let's say that you want to implement a slider in QML. How do you do this? Well, it's exactly the same things. Actually, you start and you create a new, a new file. You call it slider. 
Um, what you can do, I mean, the slider is essentially a big rectangle, and inside you have another rectangle that you can move, you can drag, and, and you eventually will change the value by dragging this rectangle. So, so, so that tells us that we want essentially two different rectangles. Um, we probably want some border for the first slider, for, 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 for the slider, and we can also set some color, like um, black. Another nice feature of Creator is that it wants you if, uh, if you mistype a color name. Um, and now here, for example, what we want, it's a small rectangle, uh, which we probably need to have, well, the same width. We want a vertical slider. The same width of the parent, it's very declarative. I'm, I'm, asking, I'm not saying I want 10 pixels. I want the same width of the parent uh, widget. And the height should probably be the same of the width. We want just a little rectangle that we want to move. Um, that's it. Uh, we also, let's add some color. And so we create this new slider. Actually, we can also de define um, uh, a default value for um, the width and the height. For example, I think that width, a very small width for the vertical slider is okay. So we can probably go for something like 14. And the height, I don't know, can be, for example, 100 pixels. Um, and here I can place this slider. Let's say that I want to place it, I don't know, at uh, X 100. Now I have this slider. Uh, of course, I can't, I can't move this little rectangle. Uh, and, and it doesn't look that gorgeous yet. And I can't move the rectangle. So, so then again, we can um, use the mouse area to do that. So what we do is to create a mouse area. Um, and what we want to do is to fill. This mouse area is this little rectangle that you put on top of existing widgets, actually, elements. Um, so what we want to do in this particular case is that we want to fill the cursor. And then we use this magic property, call it the target. Oops, actually I want to program this one. And now, oops, sorry, I think I need to assign an ID to cursor. Oh, yes, I think it was correct. No? Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> the font is a little bit too big. <laughs> yeah, now I can move it. But I can move it, you know, in way too many directions, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's a feature. <laughs> so, so, but that's the cool thing about QML. Now I can tune it. Oh, you tune it. Uh, okay, for example, we can restrict the axis. So we can say, you know what? Um, I think I want you to move only on the y-axis. Um, now it's a little bit better because I can move it here. It's still too far, but I can't move it here or here. Um, let's place the slider at x100, y, I don't know, 50. I have the same problem in both directions. Uh, that is something else that you can, you can easily fix. Just say that you know the minimum y will be zero, and the maximum y will be well the parent parent height. Um, we are actually done. You know this is this is a slider. Um, you can tune it, and you can make nice things out of it. So for example, uh, I don't know. Let's create an image. I think we can, um, no, actually, sorry, it's not here. Let's create an image, and I think that we can remove, at least for now, the button. Um, and let's make the, the slider a little bit transparent, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now it looks like this, and we can also round a little bit the borders, so we say, Reduce, 
radius 4. Maybe it's too much radius 2. Sorry. Yeah, that looks already already better. Oh, actually, we move a little bit too far. So we probably want to have here minus cursor height. We're done. I mean, this is perfect slider. OK, um, I guess this is about creating widgets. Of course, you can do way more than this. And actually, creating elements is OK, it's fun, and you can do amazing things, but it's all about uh, creating new user interface, new animated user interfaces. Um, so how you do that? Well, in QML you have uh, uh, you know, animations, built-in support for animations. So when you import the Qt Quick library, uh, what you would do is to import a number of those animations, like number animation, color animation, anchor animation, which what they will do is animate property of uh, a kind. So for example, a number animation will animate a number. Um, and this is a very powerful object. And if you provide the source and the target, it will provide you all, all the, essentially the, 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 the steps that you have to do to animate smoothly to the target. You can also combine those animations together. For example, you can run uh, animation in parallel or uh, sequentially. And you can also have action. So you can say, okay, you know, I want to animate, and when I'm done, I want to do something, some JavaScript code, or maybe I want to do it before, or I want to do it while animating. And there are several ways of doing this. Uh, one way which is very effective and simple, it's with using behaviors. So that is, a behavior on a property, which has this particular syntax, means that every time this property changes, you know, you should do it, okay, you should change it, but you should run this animation. Um, let's, let's try this one. Um, for example, uh, let's, let's remove the slider for now, and uh, let's go back to our button. And let's say, uh, we can also remove the image, I don't think that, that is that interesting for now. But let's say that um, you know you want to, uh, I know for unknown reason, you want to change the width of this button when you click. So then, what you will do is something like probably, I don't know. Let's make it twice as big. Um, you know, it is twice as big as before. But you see, that's that's kind of ugly. You know, it goes from a step to another step. And if it's actually bigger, if you make it 200, it's you know, even more ugly. Right. So, so what we do? Well, we just create a behavior. So we say, okay, every time you want to change uh, the width of this particular button, you do that, but you do that by performing a number animation. And, and maybe that thing has to take a second. Now, this, this will smoothly go there. And this is quite effective. And um, you probably, probably that was a bit, a bit too much. And you can specify um, quite a number of um, animation kinds of codes, but also properties for animation. And um, in Qt Creator 2.1, we provide this little refactoring operation, which is uh, um, customized essentially animations and properties. So you, you click on that little button and it pops this dialog where you can tune, for example, the easy curve. The default is a linear animation. So you will linearly create all the, all, all the values that you need to reach that point. But you can change that. Uh, for example, uh, you could go, I don't know, with this kind of curve if you want to, which, which uh, let's see what we'll do. The way it animates, it's different. Behavior, behaviors are quite effective. Uh, you can have a behavior on uh, any kind of property. Uh, for example, uh, you can have a color behavior, sorry, a behavior on a color with the color animation and, uh, you know, change the color smoothly. They're very effective. Let's take a look at um, other. Another way to animate elements in QML is uh, by using transitions. I mean, you know QML is all about uh, elements states and transitions. You can also, a few, a few built-in elements, like the grid, for example, 
uh, they provide special properties like move or add where you can specify those animations. So in this particular case, I'm saying, you know, every time you need to move an item uh, inside the grid, move the item, but do it and perform this animation. So let's take a look at this. Um, I think I can uh, go back to, um, for example, we could create, I'm introducing here the element grid. So what is a grid? Well, it's a grid of elements, uh, as you can imagine. So we call this one, this grid. Um, and here I, I can also specify how many uh, columns I want in this grid. So for example, uh, four. Um, I'm also going to introduce another element, which is uh, the repeater. Repeater is a, a little bit like uh, the for statement for QML. That means that you can, re I mean, you can create elements um, by specifying essentially a model, which can be uh, a list model, a view model, um, or it can be just a simple number. So for example, you can say, okay, repeat and create 20 rectangles. Um, okay, we, we want to assign some width and some height. So let's say, I, I guess that something like this would probably be okay. And we want to maybe assign some color. Uh, as I said before, we have the full power of Qt script, sorry, of JavaScript here. So we can call any JavaScript function. Um, we, we want to essentially generate a random color here. So what we do is to generate a color by using the math random. Um, I think I can remove, actually I can remove this button so I can just say that it's not visible. And now I have a grid of random generated colors. Um, let's try to do something with this grid and let's try to use those transitions we saw before. Um, so what we will do is, um, for example, let's say that we want to animate um, when you add objects to this grid. So we will create just a simple transition um, like the one we saw before. And then we say that in, in this simple transition, we want to create a number animation. So we want to an animate essentially numbers. And we're interested in animating, for example, the Y property. Now, if I run this runs and it's animated, I can run it again. Uh, you see it. I can probably make it a little bit slower. Let's say a thousand. And now it runs like this. And I can, of course, uh, as I said before, I can have a different easy curve. Um, you see? Why? Oh, interesting why I don't have it. Sorry. Um, and now it animates like this. Um, this is one transition for adding objects. As, as we saw before, you can have different transitions. Let's say, for example, that you want to, for unknown reasons, you want to move the objects around when you click on the grid. So we created the mouse area, mouse area again, this magic object that enables mouse events. Uh, you need to place it, we're going to place it on top of the grid. And then we say that when you click, what we're going to do is to change the number of columns that you have in the grid. You change the number of columns, then the elements inside, they have to move. So, so we say, okay, this grid columns, I don't know, in, in, by two. See, it, it's incremented, but we still don't have an animation for that. So it is incremented, but just see the final result of it. Uh, we know that we can um, change that. And in this particular case, for this particular element, that what you can do is to create another, another transition. So let, let's say that we want to create maybe exactly the same transition, but maybe we want to animate X. Makes sense. That's pretty I'm nice sorry. Easy, I think. And of course, it needs to be move. I like this. That means that, so that you know, you can clearly read this. That means that when you add a new element to this grid, you will perform that transition. When you move an element from the grid, in the grid, you will perform this other transition. 
um, and you can uh, do things like this. Um, of course, there is more. Um, there are the states, um, states and transitions. The transition we already, you know, played a little bit with them. You, you can attach those transitions, you can specify animations inside those transitions and do, well, interesting things. So what are states? Well, states are configurations. So, for example, uh, let's say that you have a push button, like the one we did before. Maybe the push button has two different states. One state when it's in the normal mode, and maybe another state is when it's pressed. Uh, there are also, you know, you can name it. I mean, if, you, if you're writing an application, you probably know that you, your component or your application is in different states. Well, QML provides um, primitive support for states. And what you have to do is to enumerate all the states you want inside this particular property called states. Uh, so that is, you just write state colon, then the square bracket, and the square brackets are, are important because you can have a list of those states. Um, and then you, 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 you create your state. For example, here we are creating a, a state called pressed. Now, what you can do in those states? Well, uh, this is the idea. What you do is to um, define what changes when you enter that state. Uh, in this example, what we are doing is that, okay, we create a new state called pressed, and what we are doing is to change the property uh, color of the object button, and we're going to assign these things a, a different color, blue. Now, how do you go from a state to another state? Well, you just assign uh, the name to the state you created to the special property called the state. It's, it's very simple. So let's give it a try. Let's create a new file, and we call uh, this one uh, demo, QML. Um, let's say that, uh, for example, we have um, a rectangle in the middle of the screen. Uh, we call this one rect. And we place it in the middle of the screen. We give this rectangle some sides. Um, and, and of course, the color. We have a rectangle in the middle of the screen. So, and as you can see here, you, what you're doing is to create a radio state. And this is what we call the default state. So the default state, which is represented by this, the empty string, literal, is essentially the state that you create by essentially assigning values to those properties. So what we want to do now is to create a different state. And in this different state, we want to change a few of those properties. And maybe we want also to define transitions. So, so then when we change those properties, maybe we can also hook there and animate uh, those changes. So let's do it. It's very simple. So as I said before, you create new states and you assign them to this special property called state states. That this is yet another feature of Creator. So if you mistype uh, a name, it, it will tell you that that name is wrong. It doesn't know about that. Um, so what we want to do here is essentially enumerate the properties that we want to change when we enter this state. So that's what we do. Uh, we say, OK, um, when we enter this state, so when the target, um, I mean, sorry, for the target rect, what we do is to change a few properties. Now, this is yet another uh, nice feature of Qt Creator. Uh, I, did, I did this line, I did this target column rect. And now here, I need to enumerate all the properties of rect that I want to change when I enter this state. Well, now we, I hand, uh, when, when I press Control space, I get all the properties, the completion for all the properties I can change for rect. We know that we want to change the color. And for example, you want to change it to, to red. Now, how do I enter this state? Um, again, we can create a simple mouse area, which enables mouse events. We place this mouse area on top of the rectangle. And then we say that when we click, the 
state of this application is my. And that's it. Um, again, uh, it doesn't look that great. <laughs> we can animate it. Um, and how do you animate? So uh, here you can uh, you can do I mean you can do more than this uh, when you enter the state. For example, here we have only one object. Let's say that we have uh, two different rectangles. Rectangle two, which has another color. Uh, I don't know, yellow. Um, it has width and height. Now we can't we can't really anchor it in the center because we already have an object in the center, so we won't be able to see the other object. So what we can do is to um, to place it. I don't know on uh, the right or the left of the other rectangle. Again, you can use anchors for that. And we can say, okay, that the left of this rectangle is essentially the right of the other rectangle. Now I have two. I, I, just, I just anchored one way. I can also anchor it the other way. Um, so for example, I can also say that the top of this rectangle is exactly the same of the top of the other rectangle. It doesn't matter where the other rectangle it is. And now they are placed kind of um, one after each other. Uh, we're still changing only one, but we would like probably to change both. Um, and then you can do it here. You just have to create another property changes, where you especially where you mention the properties of the second rectangle. I don't know, for example, you can say blue. Now I change both colors. Um, now we need to hook in this change when you change from a state to another state and we want to perform a transition there. I mean, we want to say, okay, sure, you're changing this color, but do it and maybe do it nicely. Generate all the colors maybe in the middle to get to red or blue or what is your final destination. You do that by creating new transitions and you need to add those transitions to the special property called transitions, not transition. So we do it. So we assign two transitions. We create a new, like we did before, um, now the transitions are very powerful. You, you, you have a lot of properties here. Uh, for example, you can specify um, what is the source of this transition, um, what is the target of this transition, and, and eventually all the animation that you will perform when you enter this, um, when, when you perform this, uh, this um, state change. Um, if you don't specify the from and the to, that means that this transition would be there and can be applied to any state change. So it doesn't matter from which state to which state you will change, this transition will always apply. Since we have only one state, uh, we can just ignore the from and, and to. So we just say that when we perform this, um, um, this transition, what we want to do is to animate the color. So we do color animation and um, the target uh, will be rect, so we want to animate a property animation of type color of the object rect. Um, and then we can say that the properties, the name of the color animation, that, sorry, the name of the property that we want to animate is color. And that is because you can have many properties uh, in your element that they have a, you know, a, 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 a type color. So now if I run this, this one animates, yeah. We can probably make it a little bit slower. So we see it. This one animates, the other one doesn't. Now we can animate both. Um, and there are several ways of doing this. Um, for example, let's say that we want to animate both both color with exactly the same duration. So now if I click on one, they both animate. Um, and they animate together. And that is because uh, uh, this is a parallel animation. So that is, if you, are, if you create animation objects inside a transition element, they are run in parallel. 
But sometimes this is not what you want. But then again, you can compose animation. So for example, you can create a sequential animation. So that means that now those two animations are executed in order. So if I click, this one will animate, and then the other one will animate. Um, so as you can see, um, QML is really, really powerful. You can do you know, amazing things with it. And, and you can uh, play with these transitions and these animations. And, um, and really um, have fun. Um, it's not much code. And as you can see, we probably wrote, I don't know, 100 lines of code. And try to think of how much code you have to write with graphics view or uh, with C++ to achieve the same result. Um, it's very well integrated in Qt Creator. Uh, you have a terrific IDE uh, which helps you writing QML code. Uh, you know, it tells you uh, all the mistakes that you can do, that you would do. For example, if you forgot to, to, to have the import statement, it will warn you um, by telling you that all these types are not available. Or if you mistype uh, properties, you also get a notification for that. Um, but we have quite a number of tools um, that we are creating uh, for, for QML. For example, we have a, a, a visual UI editor. You probably know about this. The, code, the, the project name um, was Bahaus. Now it's called just QML visual editor. It is integrated in a Qt Creator, and it shipped with Qt uh, Creator 2.1. Now it's in beta, so you may want to try it. Uh, it is very nice, uh, has a lot of features. And we also have a, a debugger uh, for, uh, for QML, and you can debug both QML and JavaScript, which is quite nice. So for example, when you have some JavaScript code, so for example, let's say that here, you want to do something more interesting than just changing a state, but you really want to execute JavaScript code, like, uh, I don't know, a for statement, or, um, well, or, oh, this keyboard, or stuff like that. You can have a breakpoint, set breakpoint, uh, execute these things in the debugger, step through it, and, and eventually uh, find what's going wrong in, uh, in your application. Um, we also have, we are also prototyping a tool. Uh, we, we call it Inspector, which is like, um, it's like in the middle of a debugger and um, a, a QML viewer. So what happens is that you can run your application uh, also run your application on the device, and then uh, you can go inside the Qt Creator, you change the source code, for example, you remove a binding, or you change the value of a property, and then what we do is that the Creator will automatically detect that you change that, that property, and will send the change to the running application, and that you will see in real time uh, the change applied to, 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 I don't know, to, the, to, to your app, so you can see it for real if you are running it on a device, or uh, if you are running the application uh, on your desktop. It is very powerful. All the stuff you can get it if you try the Qt, um, the Qt Creator snapshot or the beta of the 2.1. The only problem is that if you, if you want to try the beta, um, you need to go to the plugins, uh, the installed plugins, and you need to be sure that both uh, QML Designer and QML JS Inspector are enabled. Uh, if you have because uh, they, you know, they depend many, many distribution, they don't ship those plugins. And if you compile yourself, it can happen that those plugins are disabled. So you go there and you be sure that those plugins are, are there and, and available. Um, you probably already saw the visual editor. Um, the cool thing about it, it's a little bit, uh, uh, sorry, I probably messed something here. This one run. Yeah, I'm probably missing something. Um, yeah, I have a big font. It's very hard to read. It's probably missing brace. Yeah. Uh, you can see it. It's, it's quite nice. For example, now you have um, you have also another view of the states that we created. We have uh, the base state, which was what I was talking before. It's the state that you define because you're just initializing properties. 
And then you have the target states. In this particular case, it's the state that we created called my. And you also have a preview of those states. And um, you can also change those properties. Um, the cool thing is that this one is actually integrated in Creator, but it's integrated for real. So that means that uh, it's not just regenerating the QML file. It's working with the QML file that you provide. And it's changing the properties and it's creating maybe new objects, but it won't destroy, destroy your uh, original source file. You won't do that. So that means that if you have some weird coding convention or uh, if you have uh, comments or stuff like that, they will stay there. They will, you will keep the source the way it is. And so, for example, we could uh, go here and, uh, I don't know, change the color of this rectangle uh, or the opacity of this rectangle or something. I don't uh, what we could do. Well, we can change the opacity, I guess. Should probably one matter, but as you can see, uh, I think I selected. Sorry, I selected the wrong widget. I selected the mouse area. So we go here and we change, for example, uh, this color. Now, um, as you can see, if we go back to our, the state that we created, it replaced. I think that this one was sorry mistake. I can remove it. As you can see, it changed. The, the, the color of rec2, but it didn't touch the rest of the source code. And it did nothing with it. It just replaced the existing, the, the existing value. Sorry. And the other nice thing is that uh, the undo redo stack is a synchronized. So for example, if I undo here, right, I, uh, now I'm in the original, uh, in the original state, and, and I go back here, I have the original color. And, uh, and and this is quite nice because uh, Qt Creator essentially you can use both things. You can you can go for the visual editor if you don't want to type code, or you go for uh, the code if you are a developer and you like to type code, or uh, maybe if you are a designer and you're working together with a developer, you can work on exactly the same file, and but you don't have to care about uh, you know how things are done. You can change things visually, and we share exactly the same file. And I can prove you. For example, here I can create yet another rectangle. Uh, I place it at zero, zero, and I give some other color. Um, and, and now I have another one. And I can resize this. Um, Wait, no, no, it works actually because I resetted in the my state. So if I go in my state, you see that when I enter that state, the properties of this rectangle will be different. So that is it. So give it a try. It's uh, actually, we, we really think that uh, we did a great job here. Uh, you know, we did, we did great things, both in the QML library, in the QML language, and in our tools. So we really want to know what you guys think about it. And I mean, I'm really looking forward to see QML applications. And I guess that's all for me. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for questions. So hello, hey. uh, I have a question uh, referring to the QML files. Are they uh, compiled into, a, no, they're uh, in the binary. So can I exchange them in runtime or some stuff like that? Uh, okay, so QML, a little, a little bit of the story about QML. Uh, QML is based on uh, Qt script, which, has, uh, which is our script engine. So that's also the reason why it has this JavaScript-ish um, syntax. Um, we use JavaScript everywhere, and as you know, JavaScript is not compiled. It's just plain text. Uh, it is true that we are now we're using a web script, uh, sorry, JavaScript core, which uh, comes with a just-in-time compiler. So, it, so those uh, QML files eventually at runtime 
they will be compiled into native, native code. So they run really fast. But you have the source code there. So it's, it's, they are just like any other scripting language, like uh, JavaScript or uh, any other language. You, you have access to the source code. It's in plain code. You, you, we don't generate any file in the middle. Uh, one more question. Uh, is it possible to connect uh, from the QML uh, element to the outside, like to my C++ application? Yeah. And I have a button and I want to show another in the QML and I want to show another window of my application. Yeah, it is possible and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. Okay. So <laughs> if you want. <laughs> but it is definitely possible. And this is essentially what I was trying to say in the first slides. Um, QML plays nice with existing technology. You know, it, it works with Qt C++, with your own C++ elements, uh, with mobility. We have wrappers uh, in mobility for QML. Um, it, as I said, we did a great job there. It, it really works very well. Um, so give it a try. I agree. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, hello. Is there uh, any plan to uh, run those uh, Qt script-based applications directly in the web browser? I think there is uh, some guy in the open source community uh, that he wrote a small plugin using Qt. I mean, this is just Qt. So it's like a Q widget. So you can embed it in whatever you want. And I think that what he did it, it to, is to implement a small um, plugin for, uh, I think, Mozilla, I'm not sure about that, where he embeds uh, QML. I'm not sure that this is the way to go. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, what I think, what, personally, what I like about QML is that you can use it for uh, system applications. And, and maybe, but maybe for, I think for browsers, you will end up having so many problems, maybe, like you no know, security issues or other kind of things, which maybe 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 you know how to handle or maybe not. But then it's something that I don't think that we have planned to do it. And uh, I don't know if uh, this open source plugin is actually doing this. I don't know if it's uh, secure enough to, to, to be installed. Uh, will there be some sort of libraries for all the widgets or for the buttons and, and uh, some text edits and yeah. something like that that is uh, ready to use? Actually, I have to thank you because I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we have a lot of elements and also the elements we have in, in the library are things like uh, the text element, the text edit element. Uh, we also have uh, the WebKit element, so you can also have a WebKit browser. Um, and we started a few months ago a project in, uh, in Nokia, we call it Qt Component, where we are creating a, a set of components, like, like the widgets that you have right now in QWidgets. Uh, so, so all of them, like you know, the push button or uh, the list view, I mean all of them, um, in QML, 100% in QML. And they will um, look native in a way. So for example, if you're using uh, Migo, um, you know, they will uh, get the style from Migo devices. Uh, it's very, very interesting. The, the other interesting part is that this project is open source and developed in the open. So there is a Git repository uh, in qt.guitarius.org where you can go and download the code and try the code. Uh, it is very nice. And we are, we are recreating essentially all, all our widgets with QML, with pure QML. Uh, maybe I just didn't get it right. Uh, can I include my own widgets into QML? Uh, are you talking about your own Q widget inside the QML my own, scene? My own yeah. C++ written There are Q two widgets. ways of doing this. Uh, I'm going to explain both tomorrow. <laughs> but, um, but of course, this QML builds on top of our existing technology. I mean, what we have today. So, for example, this stuff is based on Q graphics view. And as you know, you have widgets on graphics view. So you could do that. And we have also a couple of examples for that. Now, if you want your own Q widget and you don't want to have Q graphics view in the middle, you can do it. You have to, uh, you, you can still use QML and animate your own widgets uh, with QML, but you need 
to change a little bit the way you write the code. And, and as I said, I'm going to show that tomorrow, but that, that is definitely possible. Is it possible to uh, view a video in this buttons or so? I think that uh, we have the multimedia, um, the cute multimedia project, and I think that they also have bindings for QML, so don't see why not. And then again, uh, you can create eventually, I mean, QML comes with an SDK. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow, but you can extend QML in C++. So, you know, at the end, you will have the QPainter and you can do whatever you want there. Uh, let, let's say we ha I have a database with, let's say, 200,000 images. Uh, and I pack this in a, in a model and I have a filter proxy that's controlled by an imp input element and I want to show the selected images in a cover flow. Yep. Uh, I mean, can this be done in uh, QML? Actually, How yes. Hard? Actually, yes, and oh, it's also very, very simple. Uh, and it is simple because uh, in the built-in library, you know, this QuickPick library, uh, we have list model, which is a bunch of you know, a model that we have, um, the XML list model and you know, a few more. Those models are actually based on Q abstract art and view and abstract art and model, sorry. So that means that, um, uh, and also if you have your own Q abstract art and model, you can register your own Q abstract art and model into QML and use it. And we, we have plugins for that. So you can provide, you can feed the engine with your own model and you can also feed the engine with your own uh, image provider. So if you have a images, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, in some weird format, and maybe you need to do something special when handling images because maybe they are big or maybe they are too many, you can create your own image provider. It's one of the plugin that you can write and, and contribute to QML. So you can do both, and I don't think that is hard. It's not hard at all. Then I would like to uh, say it's amazing integration between your designer and uh, creator. And since you're giving it away now, I think it would be right to say thank you for that. Yeah. Um, but I noticed the, the marvelous integration, and then we came to the debugger, and you just wrote, we can do that. Yes, with, and then uh, we continue writers. with something else. So I have to ask, when Again, will the debugger be ready? Do you know uh, that? I know it has um, been. Yeah, there has been a lot of talk, plus plus um, like and I trust your word more like than the other guy at the opening session. Okay, so I can ans I think I can uh, answer this one, but uh, you're also lucky because we have the guy that is maintaining, you know, the new debugger, the new QMLJS debugger here, uh, Kai. It's somewhere, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I can probably point you to, to Kai later, but uh, we had the prototype working. Uh, the big problem is that uh, we really want, we really feel like, um, uh, you know, this debugger needs to be really good and really great. The, mostly because this is a new language and, you know, and we want to provide you the tools that you need to, you know, to create awesome applications. So in order to do this, we need to hook and change a little bit the QML engine. So what we want to do uh, is um, take the QML engine as it is right now today and try to hook to the right place to get the information we want. So as you can see, we need to change a little bit creator and a little bit cute in order to achieve that. And we are doing this. And we did and changed it cute a little bit. Actually, you know, we, we have to come to compromises there because uh, we have no release schedule. And we changed it cute a little bit, let's say enough to have uh, a small feature set. You know, the feature set that we thought is important. And we create a plugin out of it. I think the plugin is right now in Qt Creator. Uh, I don't know if it's enabled or disabled uh, by default, but it's in Qt Creator right now today in 2.1. So you will have the debugger. The point is that uh, the point is that it's not awesome yet. Let's say that <laughs> you will. You have to wait a little bit to get all the features you want. But this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to hook into the right place in order to have those kind of features. Is it? Okay, um, so with the debugger, you can um, set a breakpoint on the JavaScripts. The, the, um, can you also uh, sort of spy in and see what's, um, what the bindings are all bound to? So um, what JavaScripts is going to be run as in response to a, bind, uh, a property changing? 
what's bound to that, and oh. what's bound to that, and how it sort of proliferates through the system. So you mean you mean you want to know the dependency tree? Uh, I think this one is tricky. Uh, and this is because uh, QML is very, very optimized. We can probably try to guess it. Uh, I mean, um, the QML engine, uh, it's, I mean, we have, of course, a full uh, front end. We have the abstract, the abstract syntax tree. We run some semantic faces. But, of course, to have those kind of dependencies, um, unfortunately, you, you really need the real thing. Um, and the thing that for how QML is implemented right now today, uh, this would be tricky to, to achieve. Because uh, um, I think this would be tricky. It, it, it may happen, uh, but right now I don't think it is that easy. Yeah. Um, I think it's the last question. Okay. Um, is it possible to translate uh, text? different language? Uh, I'm sorry? For the text that will be shown, mm -hmm. is it possible to translate in different languages? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, you can do that for both uh, QML and um, Qt script. Uh, we have one function called QSTR. I think we have an example. Um, Yes. Uh, there is this directory where you may want to look at, and there is essentially an example that shows exactly this. Uh, I don't know if you guys had time to look at our examples, but they are really good. Uh, they are beautiful. Um, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, I'm going to show you this one just to give you an idea of the things you can do with QML. Uh, I know this is, oh, I don't have the internet connection. This is trying to fetch uh, images from the net. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the internet connection. I can't show you. Or maybe I do. Nope. Um, yeah. So, well, I, I don't know, just, just, just look at our examples. They are really good. For example, this photo browser may be interesting, uh, interesting for you. Uh, it's try to fetch photos from, from the net, and it shows them in, uh, in albums, and you can browse, browse them, you know, go through them. It's, it's actually very beautiful, and, uh, and it's not much code. But we pretty much have examples that they cover all the areas. So just look there. It's very well documented. So, a last question. Anyone? So, thank you, Roberto. Thank you. So, we hope you enjoy.